Well, I think the beginning is a great place to start, and the machine that's pixel plowing through your video content should be at the top of your mind when you decide to become a serious video editor. Whether you're working in-house for a studio or freelancing on your own, understanding how your computer hardware affects your editing speed is integral to becoming an efficient video editor. Let's start at the top and take a look at one of the easiest things to control in your computer setup, storage. The general rule to live by when editing is whenever possible, use multiple storage locations based on the type of data that your NLE or nonlinear editor is storing. Premiere Pro needs to reference three types of data and keeping them separated onto individual speedy storage locations helps the program perform better. The same principle can be applied to other NLEs like DaVinci Resolve, Avid, and Final Cut Pro. The three sections can be broken up into media, scratch disk, and project files. Media storage should be on fast hard drives or network storage that has a large capacity. Due to high resolutions and raw media, it's not uncommon for even small projects these days to take up multiple terabytes. Scratch disks. These house the cache, render, and preview files that Premiere Pro uses to reference source media, and it makes playback faster. So, the faster your scratch disk, the better. Project files. Premiere's project files are the database that holds your project's information together. Keeping these on a separate drive from the media and the scratch disk makes reading and writing to the project files more efficient, and it also gives you a little extra backup in case your media storage craps out on you. So let's imagine that your media storage dies. Link the project file that you've been backing up to the backup of your media, and you're in business. So let's go ahead and break this down. Media storage comes in a variety of options that you've probably heard of. Let's take a close look at each. Hard drives, raids, and network storage. Hard drives. These little dudes are the backbone of modern video production and editing. Without their ever expanding storage capacities and speed, we would still be digitizing footage from tapes and storing that media on daisy chain firewire drives to finish an edit. Not any fun. So in short, hard drives are convenient and cheap, but they can be prone to failure, especially spinning drives. That's one of the many reasons why you should always have some type of backup to your project's footage. Good hard drives for editing come in three flavors. NVMe solid state drives, regular solid state drives, and spinning hard drives. There's an interesting correlation on how these drives are ranked. The faster they are, the lower their storage capacity. NVMe solid state drives are great for speed, but their capacity is dwarfed by the multi-terabyte non-volatile spinning drives. Hard drives can connect to your system internally or externally, and in many cases, like modern Macs and most laptops, you'll always have to opt for adding external storage. When you do, just make sure that it connects via USB 3, Thunderbolt 2, or 3, or a better connection that comes out in the future. One last thing, you probably will be using a spinning hard drive at some point in your video editing career. Make sure that when you do that, you're using a 7200 RPM hard drive or faster. Anything lower than that, and you're not going to have good bandwidth or throughput for your video files. Now we're getting to some fun stuff. RAID arrays are basically groups of hard drives that work together to form a single storage space. RAIDs offer increased capacity, speed, and redundancy, but they come at a cost, and that cost is that they can be very expensive. Now, there seems to be an infinite amount of ways to configure a RAID, but these five modes right here are prevalent in the video editing landscape. We'll take a closer look at each to briefly understand their pros and cons, but know that it's easy to find RAID reference material online if you ever have in-depth questions. Just give it a quick Google. So let's start with RAID 0. RAID 0 is like running across hot coals. It's awesome until you get burned. Using a minimum of two hard drives, this RAID mode is cheap to implement and gives you both fast read and write times with increased storage capacity. It's awesome. But the downside is that if one of those drives fail, all the data is gone forever. Womp womp. Moving on to RAID 1. If RAID 0 and RAID 1 were siblings, RAID 0 would be the wild teenager and RAID 1 would be the very responsible young adult that you would someday like to have pick your nursing home when you're an older person. So what that means is that RAID 1 again takes a minimum of two hard drives, but it has slow write times due to the data being mirrored across the drives. It does have a slightly faster read time thanks to being able to access two drives, but more importantly, it's redundant. So if one drive in the RAID 1 array fails, the other drive is an exact copy that is still usable. Swap in a fresh new drive and the RAID will rebuild itself automatically. RAID 5. So where two drives are good, four are better, right? 
RAID 5 starts to bridge the gap between safety and performance. It gives you fast read and write times and allows for a single drive to fail thanks to some fancy mathematics called parity. Rebuilding a RAID 5 with a new drive after a failure can take some time, and that basically depends on the storage capacity of the RAID. Also, read and write performance will be reduced while the RAID is rebuilding. All that said, I have been saved by this RAID 5 setup more times than I can count. RAID 6. Now this is probably the closest thing that you can get to a non-tape-based archive, and we'll talk more about that in part 12, way on down the road. But basically, RAID 6 is very slow for both read and write, but it can withstand up to two drive failures that leaves your data intact. Personally, I use RAID 6 as a time machine backup for my desktop and any recently delivered editing projects so that I have quick access to that material if I need it. And then when I'm ready to send it into cold storage, I can put it onto an LTO tape, which again, we will talk about more in part 12. Okay, RAID 10. Now, this is hands down my favorite RAID mode. RAID 10 has the best of both RAID 1 and RAID 0. It's very fast on both reading and writing, and it has good redundancy. It can withstand one or possibly two failed drives and still leave the data accessible. And it's one or two because it depends on which drive fails and how that's mathematically calculated due to the parity. Stuff that's way over my head, but just know it's a good thing. So, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and the cost here is overhead. For the parity in RAID 10 to work, it eats up half of the total possible storage capacity. So, if you have 48 combined terabytes, that would reduce to 24 terabytes in RAID 10. It's a bummer, but for the safety and speed, it's a worthwhile cost, in my opinion. Now that we've covered the different RAID modes that I think are great for video editors, I want to look at some recommended hardware that you can use to implement a RAID on your own. So as one last thing before moving on from the RAIDs, you'll most likely be interested in hardware RAIDs that connect externally to your computer. These can come with hard drives or a hard drive can be purchased separately to put them into the hardware RAIDs. Just know that when you're adding drives to a RAID, you need to make sure that they are the same model and capacity. This is very important. Also, if you're interested in picking up a RAID for yourself, these are three that I currently use or have used and absolutely love. You can check out links for these in the part one PDF. Okay, so rounding out the storage options is network storage. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because if you're on network storage, chances are you're in a facility with IT personnel that are taking care of you and making sure that you are connected. So bottom line is that servers are fast, they're scalable, and they are secure. Their structure is almost always unique to the facility that they're in, and the one thing to take away about network storage is that all the servers are not equal, okay? So just because there's a big box that you can put data in doesn't mean it's gonna handle video well. When using a server for video editing, it should be built with video capabilities in mind. So though you can edit from a server designed to host documents and databases and things like that, the read and write times will be slow, sluggish, and you're gonna wanna pull your hair out. If it's meant for video, it's gonna work well, and it's gonna work well for multiple people accessing it at the same time. Anyways, moving on. Let's take a closer look at the scratch disks. So like I said earlier, scratch disks hold temporary information like cache files and previews that help the NLE move faster. Faster scratch disks are always better. So that's why I like to use an NVMe solid state drive as a scratch disk. If you're working with a team of editors though in a network environment, it's important to put your scratch disk on the network storage that everyone has access to. If you don't do that, every single editor that accesses a project will have to create all of the same media cache information like previews and waveforms and render files over and over and over on their own scratch disks. In the end, this wastes time and it wastes local storage space. If you put everything on a centralized scratch disk on the server, all editors have access to it. That way, once a preview file is written, it doesn't have to be written again and everybody can access it. Okay, so that wraps up media storage. I'm sure you're glad to be done with that. Up next is your computer's processing power and where you should put your money in a new computer setup. Unfortunately, there's no black and white answer for what makes the best computer. It's all dependent on the programs that you use. In general, I guess that bigger is always better, but your wallet probably won't agree. Different programs rely on the separate parts of your computer in different ways. So for example, if you intend on editing only in Adobe Premiere, then you need to get the very best processor that you can afford followed by a good graphics card. If you're frequently jumping from Premiere to DaVinci Resolve, then get a good processor, but invest in a better graphics card or multiple graphics card because DaVinci relies heavily on the GPU. In most every case though, no matter what, more RAM or memory is always a good idea. 
16 gigabytes of RAM should be your absolute minimum if you're serious about video editing. So considering absolute minimums, let's look at some minimum specs for your computer in general. Mac users, check out the accompanying PDF for part one that links to the minimum system requirements for these three NLEs, Adobe, Avid, and Apple Final Cut Pro. Windows users can reference these locations too, but you should also check out Puget Systems. I cannot emphasize how amazing these guys are, and I swear I am not being paid to say that. Puget Systems builds custom workstations for power PC users across many different fields, including video editing. They will tailor build a system to suit the video editing program or programs that you use the most often and frequently write up free to read white papers and blog posts to share their testing and research on the latest computer hardware. These guys are amazing and I, I really can't emphasize that enough. Their customer service is stellar. If you ever have any questions about your Windows setup, reach out to these guys and they can help you out. Okay. So moving away from performance, we need to discuss how to get video in and out of your machine. Obviously you can export a video, but it's useful to be able to watch it on a large monitor or a television while you're editing. And if you're planning to do any professional color correcting, a reference monitor is a must and it has to be calibrated, but that's a whole other topic. Anyways, so aside from monitoring while editing or coloring in many areas of the video world, it's still important to be able to capture directly into a computer. So whether that means you're recording from tape or you're recording from a camera or you're recording from a screen record of a video game, it doesn't matter. We still need a way to ingest that in real time into the computer itself. With a little bit of extra hardware, we can do both of those things. So we have internal and external options. On the internal side, you can add dedicated SDI cards to a desktop computer. These are a couple of options from Blackmagic Design and AJA or AJA. I personally run an Intensity Pro 4K on my desktop. You can find links to all of these in the part one PDF. Same thing goes for these external options. If you don't have the ability to add internal cards, these external pieces of hardware are perfect and sometimes can even offer more flexibility with the inputs and outputs than the internal cards. All right, that's it for computers and part one is done. Next up, we're gonna dig into some real footage, start doing some tutorials and talking workflow. See you in part two.